Yeah. Right. Yes. So um, Michael Bulch is the technical lead at Alexandria Foundation Consulting, has 14 years of experience as a research practitioner specializing in entity quantification, application spanning engineering, defense, medicine, and finance. So yeah, please take it away. All right, cool. So um, um, I assume most of you were here for uh, last week's presentation uh, by Dr. Martin. And this is kind of a follow-up on that. Um, a few of you asked about you know, numerical methods or sampling-based methods for working with uh, inferential models, and I'm going to cover some of that today. So uh, we're going to start with the basics, just a real quick run through what statistical inference is in the broader uncertainty quantification context, what confidence curves are. They go by a bunch of different names, and I'll review those real quick so you can find the one that connects to you. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how you represent you know, input structures via sampling. So the idea, the focus of this presentation is going to be on taking a bunch of simple input variables for which you have inferential uncertainty and cranking them through some function. That's the goal. That's how um, uncertainty quant or statistical inference problems usually present to me in engineering. Uh, I know it's a little different for statisticians, but this is an engineering talk for engineers. Okay, <laughs> so. Uh, we'll go through how you represent these through sampling, how you build joint structures on multiple variables, then what it looks like when you crank those up through some function, what the sampling representations look like, uh, what you can do to get even better structures based on those sampling representations, and then how you can assess those numerically to see if you're tweaking, see if anything bad, and then uh, I'll just run through a summary of what the methodology looks like and what the uh, future work is going to need to be on these methods. So, you know, just perfunctory, uh, what is statistical inference? We're usually inferring a fixed parameter from random data. So you've got some parameter that determines the distribution and for some random variable that you can observe, and you're trying to infer the parameter from the random observable. There are two big traditional approaches to this, a Bayesian inference and a frequentist inference, and they both have different weaknesses, um, as I'll get into on the next slide, and as Ryan got into last week. Uh, Bayesian inference has some serious reliability issues in addition to it's kind of weak on interpretation. Uh, frequentism is, of course, strong on those fronts, but its weakness is that it's got these really narrow kind of hackneyed ways of representing uncertainty in your inferred parameter. So what we want, and by we, I mean myself, Dr. Ferris and Dr. Martin, what we want is a methodology that combines these strengths of both methods without having to put up with the weaknesses of either. So um, like I said last week, Ryan Martin went over the false confidence theorem. Um, it's this problem that you'll encounter trying to use not just Bayesian inference, but any additive or i.e. purely probabilistic representation of inferential uncertainty, where you'll get these really high assignments of belief to a false proposition. And at least in satellite conjunction analysis, we've seen that this presents a serious practical problem where you'll be consistently and severely, and by severely, I mean by several orders of magnitude, underestimating your collision risk exposure. But Ryan went over that last week, so we're gonna skip on to the next slide, which is confidence curves. So this is the framework we're work using right now that inherently avoids the false confidence problem. It goes by a lot of names. So confidence curve is the oldest and simplest name, so that's what I'm going with today, that goes back to Birnbaum in 1961. Uh, in 2012, I was calling them consonant confidence structures, and I still do occasionally. And then uh, Ryan Martin from last week, he calls them inferential models. And those different names do kind of correspond to different derivation methods, but it's the same object with the same properties. But what is it? <laughs> so it's a real simply, a confidence curve is a sequence of nested confidence regions at all levels going from zero to one. 
And what makes this different, what makes this new framework different from just the, what makes it more than just a plotting method is that we actually treat this thing as a possibility distribution that can make um, assignments of belief and plausibility to whatever proposition interests you. And this, of course, this also pools together some commonly known dualities in frequentness inference between p-values and confidence regions. You know, it's been known for a long time you can get confidence regions by inverting a test statistic. Well, this visualizes that. These confidence curves just put it all out there so you're looking at it all at once. So there are lots of ways to derive these. Um, last week, Ryan went over uh, this structural model approach to doing it. Uh, I have a somewhat, I think, easier approach, which is just to use a test statistic and compute um, individual p-values for each parameter value. So p-values are plausibilities, and the core of a pointwise, or sorry, the core of a um, possibility distribution is a pointwise plausibility function. And you get that by, via this little equation at the bottom um, where you're just saying, what is the prob for any one parameter value, what is the probability of getting a less you know, favorable result than the one you actually obtain? And I, I tend to prefer likelihood or likelihood adjacent test statistics. So, yeah, here's a quick illustration of uh, how belief and plausibility values are calculated from a possibility distribution and uh, also, you know, how any alpha slice you can draw off of this is going to be a whatever percentage confidence interval. Um, I have this, these illustrations in any presentation or paper I write, so there they are. Refer back to it later if you like. We're going to move on because I got 37 slides to go, or 32 at this point. All right, so what are the properties of confidence curve? Well, the belief assignments are reliable. If you start from that test statistic formulation, you're going to get reliable assignments of belief. Moreover, the Martin Liu uh, validity criterion, which applies to all sets everywhere, can be simplified to one um, condition that you need to check which is for every individual you know, parameter value, if you sample the data, assuming that's the true parameter value, the plausibility at that parameter value should have a right of uniform distribution. And we're going to be using that uh, criterion to check the validity of our structures later on in the presentation. So there are some other goals when building these structures too, though. This, you know, there's a lot of play in this theory. You know, there's not yet one normative structure for any one problem of a statistical inference. Although one day I hope we will have uh, a normative structure. But for now, you're we're kind of going by the seat of our pants. Um, so here are some other goals we we like to aim for. Uh, likelihood conformity is one that I like, which basically means where your likelihood, your raw likelihood function goes up, your plausibility should also go up, and where it goes down, plausibility should also go down, or at least they shouldn't contradict each other, and that generally gives you a preference for two-sided structures, and if you want to read more about that, go check out my uh, recent paper on binomial inference. You also want efficient belief plausibility assignments, um, or another way of saying that is you want the tightest structure you can get while still satisfying everything else. And I'm not going to get into this in this presentation, but you also want sensible belief and plausibility assignments. And what I mean by that is even once you've enforced reliability, you can still get some weird one-off belief assignments that are obviously wrong. And there are um, there are little tricks for getting around that, but that is a whole presentation unto itself. Okay, so we're we're moving forward with conf confidence curves. How do we uh, approximate them via Monte Carlo? And this turns out to be really simple if you just jump in and do it. <laughs> 
So you want to get a Monte Carlo sample for the parameter you're inferring. You just um, you want to keep track of the plausibility attached to each sample point, and that's it. That's it. It's, it's one extra step beyond Monte Carlo for probability theory. Um, it, it's really that simple. Now we don't have the undergirding theory yet, but it seems to work all right so far. So if you can, you want to sample theta from some sort of equivalent posterior fiducial, fiducial distributions and calculate your pointwise plausibilities precisely. But if you're working with a more complicated statistical model, um, there are other options like getting your sample data via Mo uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, using raw likelihood as your target, and then doing a second round of sampling of the data to um, get a reference distribution that you can use to compute your p-values, aka your pointwise plausibilities. Um, if you're real smart about it, that shouldn't take a double loop sample. Instead, it should take two sequential samples. Um, and if you want to get into that, that's a whole thing. That's not going to be the focus on this presentation. This presentation, like I said, is going to be focused on, let's say we've got really simple inputs that we want to be able to shove through a black box function. So here's a, here's a real simple example of confidence curve uh, that we want to sample randomly. Um, just normal mean, you know what the variance is. Uh, you've got some sample. And as our test statistic for deriving plausibilities, we're going to just use um, relative likelihood, which has a chi-squared distribution of one degree of freedom. So as you can tell, the Monte Carlo approximation looks almost exactly like the original confidence curve. Um, that's because I'm using 10 to the fourth samples. Here's what it looks like if you use fewer samples, just so you can see, you know, it, it is a, it's a random sample. It, we're not doing it perfect here. Um, so, so that's what it looks like. Don't worry, we're going to come back to this. Uh, here's another example problem, binomial inference. Go, like I said, go check out my new paper if you haven't read it already. Um, so in binomial inference, you're trying to infer the probability of an event, or a, you could also call it a binomial rate, uh, given k successes and n trials. Uh, the, Standard Monte Carlo uh, distribution I use for this to generate my samples is just the Jeffries posterior. And the test statistic I use to get p values is this crazy thing called the Wally likelihood. Um, that's a reference to Peter Wally. So, and that has all the structure you get from that has all sorts of wonderful properties that you'll learn about if you read my paper. But anyway, uh, because the structure has these little jumps in it, uh, the Monte Carlo sample, of course, doesn't represent those jumps. It's just the points and their plausibilities. So that ends up having this kind of, I guess you could call it a Christmas tree look. And I know Scott will like that. Uh, so again, just in case you didn't believe this is a Monte Carlo, it, it is. This is what it looks like with fewer samples. It really is just Monte Carlo. So what do we want to do with these structures? And like I said, I want to take these things and be able to crank them through any function without having to use any properties of that function. You know, black box propagation. So theoretically, propagation phi should be very simple. If you've got, you know, phi, which is a function of theta, and you've got a structure on theta, well, then you should be able to just crank samples from theta onto phi, and that'll give you plausibility distribution on phi. But there are two wrinkles. You know, we're starting, the first one is we're starting with multiple input variables that have separate structures. And then also, the, um, there's this maximization formula for doing possibilistic marginalization. And the sampling approach doesn't really do that directly, and it doesn't really enable uh, that, not directly at least. But we're going to try this anyway. We're just going to jump in and see what happens if we try the sampling approach. 
And what we're going to find is not being able to do maximization directly doesn't actually matter that much. We're going to get a nice sample haze. And if you draw a line on top of it, that'll be the plausibility function on your output variable. And the real trick is figuring out if we can tighten these structures. And you'll learn what that's all about in a minute. OK, so how do we build a joint structure You know, from multiple input variables to one structure on their, their um, I guess you could say their intersection, but whatever. Um, all right, so you're going to treat these multiple inputs as one vector parameter. And often, we're going to assume independence of the data. What that means is we're not saying independence of the parameters between each other. That's not meaningful. They're fixed constants, uh, usually. Instead, we're talking about the uh, independence between the data used to infer those different parameters, which usually shouldn't be too much of a stretch. So there are two ways to do this, uh, one of which I've discussed uh, with some of you guys before, and one of which I haven't, and it actually turns out to be the cooler way to do it. So one is this idea that in possibility theory, we already have this idea of level-wise propagation, where you take corresponding slices of each possibility distribution, and you propagate them um, via the rules of interval analysis together. And in traditional possibility theory, that's it. The, whatever level was associated with the inputs is associated with the outputs. But if you want this to be conservative for a um, statistical inference problem, you actually need to adjust the uh, plausibilities on your output, at least to get the joint structure. So that requires this little correction here. Now, the problem with that is that uh, interval propagation kind of sucks. And it sucks because it's got this um, curse of dimensionality, this really aggressive curse of dimensionality. Uh, and when you go through the literature on that, it's mostly because of sampling at the corners. So I had a cute idea at some point over the last few months, which is, well, what if we cut the corners? What if we built the joint structure in a different way that doesn't have those corners? And it turns out there's already something in the literature that does that, and it's called Fisher's Rule of Combination. Now, R.A. Fisher originally came up with this for composite hypothesis testing. And at a certain level of abstraction, when we're trying to build these joint structures, that's actually what we're doing. We're, we're building a composite hypothesis test. But don't get too wrapped up in that. Just you know that we've got this nifty little formula involving chi-squared distributions that, assuming independence holds, you can apply to get a joint structure. And here's, if you look at plausibility contours from the two different structures, you know, in some idealized case, this is rough, roughly what they look like. The thick lines where we've cut the corner, that's what you get from Fisher combination. The thin little squares, that's what you get from, um, you know, level-wise propagation. That's the joint structure you're dealing with. And like I said, uh, as dimensionality grows, these corners become absolute murder to sample. So generally, I'm going to prefer the circles, the, uh, the Fisher combination. All right, so let's do an example. Let's do a real simple example. Say we've got normal inference uh, for two distributions. So we're interested in the difference between two means. Okay, and we've drawn some data, and here they are. <laughs> Here's the uh, here are the confidence curves we got for each mean. All right, so we we've sampled them. What happens when we crank those sample throughs? We get this. We get a sample haze. Okay, we we drew the samples. We built the joint structure. We cranked them out onto mu two minus mu one. We got the sample haze. And if you look at it. If you just look at the top line, that looks like a plausibility function, and it, and it is. So like I promised, it's not actually a big deal that we can't do any kind of optimization. Just draw the line that goes on top, and continuity takes care of the rest. Uh, you may notice that the Fisher, um, 
Fisher combination ended up giving us a slightly tighter structure than level-wise propagation. That will not always be the case, but it's often the case. Okay, so what's up with this haze? All right, so for each theta value, each mu1 minus mu2, there are an infinite number of mu2 minus mu1s that map to that one phi point. Okay, so you're not getting the top value. You're just getting for each phi. Instead, you're just getting some random possible value. Now, so any one, any one point is unlikely to be the top point at the top of that curve, but it doesn't matter because enough of them get close. So you can still draw that top line and get your pointwise plausibility distribution, or rather an approximation to it. So, um, but the cool thing is, um, you don't even have to do that much. As if the proposition, i.e. the set you're interested in computing plausibility and belief for, as long as that's not too narrow, you could just use the raw sample points and apply the rules of possibility theory to them, and you'll get a good approximation of the belief and plausibility that should have been assigned to that set, even without worrying about the top line function, just using the raw sample plausibilities. Um, but if you are interested in the narrow proposition, which we will be la later, you do need that top line function. Like if you wanted the plausibility of an individual point, you need that top line function. So it depends what you're trying to do, whether or not you need it. But there are lots of algorithms for drawing, taking a haze of sample points and drawing a line on top of them, motivated by other applications. Okay, so. Here's what it looks like if we just look at the top line function. The solid line is what you got using Fisher's rule of combination, and the dashed line is what we got doing level-wise propagation with the um, correction for independence. And like I said, in this case, Fisher's rule is slightly more efficient, but it's no biggie. Now let's do another example. This is uh, the feeler creasy prop, where you want to know the ratio between those two normal means. And this is notorious in the statistics community for giving weird results. I think Ryan went through this last week. I don't remember. This is what it looks like. This is what your sample haze for that problem looks like. And now, actually, this is one of those weird cases where a level-wise propagation actually gets you a more efficient uh, answer. But, is this really the best we can do? Like just taking the sample highs and drawing a line on top of it, is that the most efficient structure we can get? And is the, the answer to that question is no, um, emphatically no. For example, uh, these problems are simple enough that you could just use relative likelihood on your target variable, your output variable directly. Use that as a test statistic and um, get this nice blue line, which is tighter than either structure. And here's what's even cooler, is we can actually take our sampling-based approach and reproduce that exact solution uh, pretty easily. And the key is just reducing the degree of freedom, meaning um, we have this chi-squared formula for uh, getting our plausibilities. And we originally started using treating this as though it had theta, whatever the dimensionality of theta was in this case too, that many degrees of freedom. If you crank it down just to whatever your output variable is, in this case, just one degree of freedom, you'll get that ideal solution to the problem. Now, what's the basis for that thing? Okay, what, what's the basis for, for being able to tighten these sample plausibilities? Well, in this case, we're dealing with normal mean inference. And both of our functions, even though one of them is nonlinear, they both represent linear constraints on theta. And if you got those two factors, you're actually always able to solve this via relative likelihood, and that relative likelihood will have. Um, or rather negative two log of that relative likelihood will have a chi-square distribution with dimensionality of the degrees of freedom. 
So this is a special case, but as we're going to see going through the presentation, it works pretty well as an approximation on other problems where these restrictions don't apply. So instead of doing all of that work, figuring out well, what is my maximum value of likelihood for each you know, value of the marginal variable, which you know, is a pain in the neck, instead of doing all that, we're just going to um, use the fact that on both in both the original parameter space and the output space, likelihood and plausibility have a one-to-one -one relationship. And that's going to um, allow us to just do this transform where, like I said, we're just tightening the structure by lowering the plausibilities by a degree of freedom. And how generalizable is that? That's going to be an open question, but more than you might think at first. And if we're applying this uh, simplification, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. The next question we're going to ask is, if we didn't know there was a tighter structure, if, if we didn't have an analytic solution to this problem, how would we know that there was room for improvement? And that's where we're going to get into some um, fun meta statistics. So, and I think Ryan did a little of this last week, checking for validity. So you can actually check for validity and overconservatism at the same time. Uh, you pick a true value of theta at which you're going to generate values of x. You, then you generate those Monte Carlo replicates of x, i.e. your data. Um, each x generates a confidence curve for your marginal variable. You check the plausibility at the you know, true value for p corresponding to your true value for theta. And the um, Monte Carlo distribution of that plausibility over repeated draws of the data should have a strictly right of uniform distribution. That's validity. That's the validity criteria. If you satisfy that, you satisfy everything else about uh, the validity criteria. But we also want a structure that's as tight as possible while still being valid. That's efficiency. So one way to tell that you've got an inefficient structure is if you look at your plausibility distribution and all those values are way to the right of uniform. You know, there's like a big gap between them and the uniform distribution. Okay. And you don't just want to do this for one theta. You want to check a range of theta so you can convince yourself, yes, this really is a confidence curve no matter what my true parameter value is. And you notice here I've got rinse and repeat for several true values of theta. I've got rinse and repeat crossed out because you can actually, if you pick your values of your you know, trial values of theta ahead of time, you can actually do this all in one round of sampling and reweight that sample for different values of theta. Um, and that'll save you a bunch of time so that you're not, again, doing a double loop sampling. Instead, you're just doing one big batch that does everything at once. So uh, I did this for um, the difference between these problem using the original sample top line, sampling based top line. As you can see, there's a lot of daylight between the nominal uniform distribution plausibility and the actual um, what we actually got. Ditto goes for the feeler creasy problem, the ratio of means. But if we tighten, of course, then we get almost a perfectly uniform distribution for both of them. And actually the reason it's not perfectly uniform is just sampling error. Like if we were to do this with um, infinite Monte Carlo replicates, all those lines would sit on the uniform line perfectly. So let's get, let's do a real problem. Let's do something that we don't have an analytic solution for. So I do have an analytic solution for individual binomial rates, but I don't have an individual solution for any function involving those. And um, I'd like to see what those solutions might look like. You know, so let's say I want the difference between two binomial rates. Uh, I've got 10 samples for each. For one binomial rate, I got two successes, and the other one I got six successes. So how, how big is the difference? How sure am I that it's that big, et cetera, et cetera? 
So we do the sampling, we crank it through, and here's what uh, we get out as our sampling haze. And you'll notice the first thing you should see about these plots is these sampling hazes are different than for normal inference. They're, at least in the top half, they've got these weird flakes. And the reason for that is because the um, plausibility distribution also consists of flakes. So instead of having a continuous line and then all different sorts of values from those lines are getting combined, you've got flakes and the flakes are being combined. That's what that looks like on the outside. And it's nothing to get hung up on. Uh, when you draw the top line, it actually looks a lot more coherent. So here's what we do if we you know, start with the original joint structure that's conservative and that we know is safe. And then here's what happens if we apply our um, degree of freedom reduction to tighten the structure. And you'll notice it looks a lot like those original structures. You know, it looks, at least to my eye, sensible because I'm really used to looking at these uh, binomial step structures. So, oh, and just to let you know, the black is, uh, the black line is what you get via Fisher combination. The red line is what you get via um, level-wise propagation. So, is it the Titan curve reliable? So, here's the original curve. Here's the p-value distribution at, you know, different true theta 1, theta 2 values. Here's what that looks like for the original structure. Here's what it looks like for the Titan structure. So you'll notice uh, for at least one of the theta one, theta two variables, there's a little violation, a little bit. Um, but honestly, in practice, that kind of violation of validity, I wouldn't sweat it, personally. Uh, another weird thing to notice is that even though the Fisher structure or sorry, even though the level-wise structure is wider at most points than the Fisher structure, it still somehow weirdly violates validity worse than, or sorry, the Titan structure by corresponding to level-wise propagation, somehow violates uh, validity worse than the tighter structure. I have no idea what's up with that. So yeah, anyway. Let me just say that properly. The level-wise structure violates validity worse than the um, Fisher combination structure. So that's, um, that's a difference between two binomial rates. That's a problem I was interested in many, many years ago. Scott can tell you about it. Um, but lately, I know uh, you guys out at Liverpool are interested in positive predictive value. Uh, that is, Say you've got a prior for some disease in the population. You do a test with a certain sensitivity and specificity. What is the, say you've got a positive test result, what's the uh, posterior probability that that person with a positive test result actually has the disease? And if you've ever dug into the data, you know that sensitivity, specificity, and prevalence, but especially sensitivity and specificity, are never known exactly. Um, those two are definitely based off binomial trials, usually, um, of gold standard cases where you know whether or not the person has the disease and you administer them the test to see if they actually, um, how well the test works. So sensitivity is your probability of getting, getting a positive result given that they have the test. Specificity is your probability of getting a negative result given that they don't have the disease. I am misspeaking all over the place. So, sen sorry, sensitivity, probability of getting a positive result given that they have the disease. Specificity, probability of negative result given that they don't have the disease. Okay, and prevalence is just the background rate in the population at which people have the disease. And here we're going to pretend you got that via binomial inference. In real life, it's more complicated than that. Um, it's actually really useful for any one patient to drill down on their risk factors and to get even just an interval estimate of where their prevalence would be. You know, that's more relevant to them. 
but we're going to pretend you just sampled the general population. All right, so, so you started with these inputs um, as your experimentally obtained estimates of prevalence, sensitivity, specificity. Here are the structures you get for um, PPV. So the, um, in black, we've got the Fisher estimates, uh, the Fisher-based sampling estimates. And in red, we've got level-wise propagation, which is, again, just a little bit wider. Uh, interval propagation for PPV calculation is actually really easy because all the output is a monotonic function of all the inputs. But anyway, as you can see, the sampling approach does give you, with Fisher combination, does both in the original and the Titan structure give you a tighter, you know, more compact confidence curve. Um, so that really is my preferred methodology, but is it reliable? And the answer is yes. Uh, I tried a bunch of different uh, theta combinations. So as you can see, yes, there was neat, there was room for improvement. And when you use that uh, you degree of freedom reduction, you do get a reliable uh, confidence curve. So if you're wondering how to get PPV estimates um, when your sensitivity and specificity are uncertain, this is a way you can do that. So that, that's going to be, that's everything. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> it's actually really simple. Uh, at least so far, it seems to be really simple how you work with these things, um, how you can use Monte Carlo approximation to work with confidence curves. Step one, sample the inputs. Step two, you want to get plausibilities attached to each of those sample values. Step three, you want to you know, pair up your um, different input variables and build a joint structure. And I highly recommend Fisher's rule of combination. Uh, again, assuming independence between the data for your different inputs holds. Uh, step four, just crank through, through your function to get your sample haze. Step five, get a top line function on top, so draw a line on top of that sample haze. That's your point-wise plausibility distribution. Step six, tighten the structure on the output if you want. Um, so again, chi-squared degree of freedom reduction really does seem to work pretty well. Um, and then step seven, you want to resample the data to check the validity of that tightened structure. But of course, if you step if you skip step six, you don't have to do step seven. You know, if you just stick with a conservative structure on your joint input space, then that's already guaranteed to be safe on your output space. It'll just be wider than necessary. And that's going to get, that's worse with dimensionality, you know, as these problems have been pretty simple. So the reduction uh, when you apply DOF tightening, um, that reduction hasn't been too pronounced, but if, as you increase your number of input variables, you're going to want to do something to tighten things. So future work, um, convergence properties. I, <laughs> I, I literally have just been tooling around with this, being like, okay, I'm, I'm going to use you know an equivalent posterior fiducial distribution to sample these variables. That seems to work. Um, but there's no theoretical underpinning yet. So what are the convergence properties of these, you know, plausibility and belief assignments, you know, as you increase sample size? What are the requirements on your sample generating function? Like I said, I've, I've been doing something that just makes sense to me, but obviously if your uh, sample generating function is much tighter than your possibility distribution, that's going to be a problem. Uh, is there any kind of a cursive dimensionality. Uh, we know that Monte Carlo sampling is free of the curves of dimensionality when applied to random variables. Is the same true for, uh, for confidence curves? Or is the same true for confidence curves built a certain way? Like I would definitely not expect level-wise propagation to ever be free of the cursive dimensionality. But like I said, we're cutting those uh, corners with a uh, Fisher combination. So does that get us in a place where we'll be free of the curse of dimensionality? 
what are the restrictions on VOF tightening? Because there definitely are problems for which this won't work. Um, collision risk exposure and conjunction analysis is one of those problems. That's where we've got a 2D structure and basically as variance gets big, your failure domain looks like a, you know, it starts out as a circle and eventually looks like a point. So kind of makes sense that you can't reduce those degrees of freedom. It's a two-dimensional problem at least. But that's a, that's a story for another day. But yeah, how far can we get just tinkering around with VOF tightening? And what are some numerical alternatives uh, to that when it doesn't work? Anyway, so yeah, for you theory heads and statisticians out there, there's lots and lots of low hanging fruit on this methodology, like just lots and lots of simple questions to be answered uh, as far as what is the performance of the sampling technique? How applicable is it? And that is the end of the presentation. And I am ready for questions because I knew I, you know, it feels like I kind of blew through this. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you should be able to raise your hands um, in the chat in the participants area. Um, go ahead. Oh, any questions? Do any of those, I need um, anything special for when people wave their hand? Sorry? I, I'm saying, do I need to do anything special when people wave their hand? No, I think it just means they're applauding you. Oh, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. so, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I've got some questions coming through. Uh, Nick, do you have a question? Um, I suppose I've got two questions. Um, the first one might be quite simple because okay. you might have gone through it before, but I had to go and collect the parcel midway through your talk. So I missed about, <laughs> well, I missed a couple of minutes. But the, could you go over the method that you did for getting the PPV again? Because I think I missed a bit. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's just go through this step by step. Um, so we started, uh, with this nice little confidence structure or confidence curve that I've got for um, each of these three binomial rates, right? Yeah. And I sampled them randomly. And then I just cranked that through the formula for PPV that you get from Bayes' rule. Um, you know, going from the prevalence is your prior, you know. Um, Can I ask, uh, when you say you sample these confidence curves, you sample mm -hmm. them, so their distributions, or how do you, what do you mean sample them? Sure. So what I do is I pick an equivalent posterior or um, fiducial distribution, in this case, the uh, Jeffries distribution. So that's beta. You start with prior of one half, and then it becomes beta with k plus one half, and then n minus k plus one half as its two parameters. Um, so that usually that kind of sample fills out these curves really well. Um, and then at each sample point, you compute the plausibility and then crank that through. You crank through the sample values and that lands on the x-axis and then the corresponding plausibility value goes on the y-axis. Does that much make sense? Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Is, is, is it almost like a almost like a second order distribution of plausibility distributions within this structure? Um, not really, uh, if, if I understand you correctly. There, there's no second order thing you have to keep track of, just the top line. So, this, I mean, Nick may have understood, but I don't understand at all. What's the distribution from which you sample? For A beta distribution corresponding to uh, these confidence curves. So I'm not directly sampling the confidence curve. I'm to generate my theta samples uh, on prevalence, sensitivity, and specificity. Uh, to generate that, I'm sampling an equivalent posterior. So in this case, a beta distribution uh, with parameters k plus one half and n minus k plus one half. So the Jeffries, the posterior from the Jeffries. Exactly. 
for those particular numbers, 74 and 73 for sensitivity. Exactly. Why is that equivalent to that? Uh, uh, well, if you ever look at, uh, say you do a random fuzzy transformation of the Jeffrey's posterior, it matches the confidence curve. Not perfectly, of course, but pretty well. So you're saying this is an approximation or is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm choosing that sampling distribution because it fills, you know, the space where the confidence curve has positive, you know, seriously positive plausibility. It fills that space pretty well. That, that's why I'm choosing that sampling distribution. That, that's my seed of the pants criterion. So maybe like that, said, so, oh, sorry, keep going. So what that can maybe you used um, something other than Jeffrey's prior then? For what? Um, for the sample. Oh, no, no, I think I missed what you said. You mean what if you use something other than Jeffrey's? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you'd want to check to make sure you're, uh, you're uh, covering your confidence curve well. So if we go all the way back to the beginning, um, hold up, I'm just going to scroll up. So, for example, here, you know, I used Jeffries, and I can just visually look and confirm, yeah, I'm getting good coverage on each of these flights. Um, let's say I used a different posterior yeah, here, then I'd see a real sparse paucity of samples on this side of the confidence structure, and I'd be like, no, that's a bad sample, that's not going to represent my confidence curve as well. <laughs> I'm totally confused. So when you say, first off, what's the word you're using? Is it F-L-A-K-E-S? Flakes? Flakes, yes. Flakes, as in corn flakes. Okay. Yeah, or, or shelves or whatever you want to call those things. Shoulders. They're uh, shoulder pads. Um, so what's... Sure, why not? <laughs> the sampled values are numbers along the x-axis, right? Yes. So where do you get the vertical positions from these to associate with these random samples? Um, well, we've got the exact confidence curve. We've got that point-wise plausibility distribution, and I've got that uh, cooked up as a function that you can download from my company website for binomial inference. No, but but you said it was a mo well, maybe everybody. Sorry. <laughs> it's just me. But I'm like totally lost because no, no. Say say again. Uh, you you got cut off a little. Well, I, I was explaining that maybe everybody else understands, and it's just me that I'm totally lost. But it seems to me when you say you sample from this confidence curve, mm -hmm. uh, then and, and you've said it's not from the confidence curve at all, but rather from so, not a matching, but sort of an analogous posterior from a Jeffries thing that has you know it's selected by the ten and the four in this case. That yes. Um, but that, that, that's how you get your X points, but you are getting your Y points from the confidence curve. Ah, okay. Okay. You get, so, so you need to pick an analogous sampling distribution to get your X points, but you are taking your Y points from the original confidence curve, your, or the corresponding Y values. Okay, so you read them from this left graph. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now that's... Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Back to Mar uh, Nick's question then. Okay, Nick, where were we at with you? Um, yeah, so I was, ha I was happy with that. Um, I feel like given there's loads of other questions, by loads, I mean three, um, that I should let somebody else go first because my other question was off topic. Oh, okay, cool. Um, who's next? Sure, so we can go back to one about someone after, but um, a little first time we go next. Um, sure, thank you, Simon. So um, I actually have two questions, and um, the first of which I would like to ask is, uh, may I clarify view the marking new validity? Because I'm still a bit unsure what is that validity about. All right, I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I know it's about validity. Yeah, what are you asking? New validity. I'm sorry, one more time. What validity? Uh, Martin Liu, something like that. It's oh, yeah. The, yeah. 
what about it? <laughs> yeah, may I just clarify like what is this uh, concept about again? Because I think uh, I ah. don't really understand. It. No, I, I did kind of blow past it because uh, Ryan went through it last week. Oh. Um, so the deal with Martin Luther validity, uh, yeah, I think I just only expressed it in this form. But what's important about it is that it limits the rate at which uh, belief will be assigned to a false hypothesis. And by limits the rate, I mean over repeated draws of the data. Um, so in contrast, the problem I encountered in uh, satellite conjunction analysis is that um, the satellite navigators were going, ending up having a really high probability, you know, probability, let's say belief assignment, that their satellites were safe even when they weren't. And that wasn't like a one-off thing because of the structure of the problem. Even if these two satellites were guaranteed to hit, because of the way the probabilistic math works, you were still, every time, no matter what data you got, you were guaranteed to get a really high prob you know, posterior probability that they're safe. And that, that's, that's bad, that's misleading. It's really, um, and be really damaging to consistently get high belief assigned to a false proposition. You know, if it happens every once in a blue moon, that's kind of expected because you're inferring a fixed parameter from random data. So, you know, it's okay for bad things to happen occasionally, but if you're always getting a really high belief assignment to a false proposition, that's going to lead you astray. Um, so the, what the Martin Luth validity criterion does is basically it says, okay, we're going to limit the rate at which um, belief is assigned to false propositions. And that's equivalent um, in uncertainty quantification. That's equivalent to saying we're going to uh, guarantee high plausibility to true propositions. I mean, you know, because belief on one proposition is one minus plausibility on that proposition's negation. Right. So an equivalent way of phrasing uh, Martin Lee's validity is to say that the plausibility of a true hypothesis should, over repeated samples of the data, have a right to be uniform distribution. Meaning you shouldn't, just like you shouldn't be assigning a high belief to a false proposition really consistently, you also shouldn't be assigning a um, low plausibility to a true hypothesis. So those two statements are equi exactly equivalent. Right. They're just um, different ways of looking at it. And uh, phrasing that in terms of plausibility on a single true parameter gives us a compact criterion for testing these structures. So that's the role that uh, Martin Luther Liberty is playing in this presentation. Sure. Yeah, thank you. That clarifies things. Okay, and my second question is uh, mainly right, just out of curiosity. Like, uh, you, early on when you mentioned about the joint structure, um, that there's assumption, one of the assumptions is that the data that we have should be independent of one another. So my question is, uh, how does this extend to the case whereby we have data or measurements which are correlated with each other? Mm. Okay, so let me go back. Hold up, I gotta scroll around because I do have a backup method <laughs> that I haven't uh, for that case. Um, hold up. One just a moment, I promise you I'll have it in just a second. Build joint structure, okay. Let me just, if you must. there we go. This is filed under if you must. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> so let's say, um, you know, like as you correctly know, I've been assuming you've got the, the multiple inputs and uh, you can treat them separately, which is another way of saying that their data are independent. So that's if you can, that, that's if the universe likes you. If the universe doesn't like you, if you're doing a theta with correlated um, x, 
you know, with correlated data, then you basically need to treat that all as one inference problem. Um, you need to treat that x, you, of course it's multidimensional, you need to treat that x as one x, so you need to treat your, if your observables are correlated, then you need to treat them as one joint vector observable for your joint vector parameter space. Right. And uh, if nothing else, there's this methodology. You can, um, you know, start with your raw likelihood, get an MC, MC, a Markov chain Monte Carlo sample on theta, and then compute p-values for those individual thetas using weighted Monte Carlo. Um, so basically you draw a bunch of x and then um, using whatever sampling distribution and then you uh, connect those for each x you compute your test statistic whatever it is say relative likelihood and then you compute um, plausibility according to this formula down here. Okay. And um, you'll get that weight function by saying, because again, you don't want to have to do a resampling loop for every value of theta. You're going to want to do one big batch of data, gen you know, fake ge data generation. Mm -hmm. um, so you're actually going to have different weights for different theta values, you know, corresponding to each uh, sample. This is weighted Monte Carlo. So um, that's how you end up turning this into an n plus m sampling problem rather than n times m. You know, that's the difference between 200 and 10,000 sampling points. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, which I feel very clever for having come up with that. <laughs> I'm sure someone else did. It's good. I mean, it's good because it really helps to shorten the, the, the time. That definitely is going to be very helpful. And uh, sorry, back to the point whereby you mentioned that, you know, if they're correlated, Data, you just treat them as basically one, like one data, like batch kind of thing. Is that is that what we are we are saying? I'm sorry. Treat what as one what? For correlated, the correlated data set that we have, you say uh, something like you just treat them as one single data vector or something like that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So conceptually, you're treating it like that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. That, that, that would be my advice. That's not to say there's not a better way. This is all, you know, very early stage research. But, um, oh, and let me caveat that with this statement. The MCMC with raw likelihood as target function. Mm -hmm. um, I think that'll work. <laughs> I think that'll work. Do you think um, that'll work? Okay. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, if you want to check to make sure that is giving you good uh, coverage. And the way to do that is actually, you know, plot up your sample points along with the plausibilities. And if you get to the edge of your plausibility of your plausibility curve or the edge of your sample space, and you're still at like say 20% plausibility, you have not sampled the tails enough, you know. Right. Um, so uh, that may, um, and there are other things you can do to try to work your way around that. Um, that that would be a presentation unto itself, though. Um, yeah. So so this this first line of sampling uh, according to raw likelihood as your target function, that's very provisional advice. I I do not guarantee that that'll work in a high dimensional space. Um, you're gonna wanna. If you do, look, get back to me on it. Let me know how it works out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I already foresee I already foresee dimensionality being a problem for that one as well. Yeah. Um, so the fix for that, if you want to get real fancy, oh, um, I don't know. If you're able to calculate um, not just a raw likelihood but a relative likelihood, yeah, then you might want to sample according to an approximate. Um, an approximate plausibility. So you use the plaus an approximation, a real rough approximation of the plausibility curve itself as your target distribution. Yeah. And the way you get that rough approximation is, um, again, via relative likelihood 
and chi squared. So relative likelihood um, has an, appro an approximately chi squared distribution with theta degrees of freedom. Yep. Um, so for two degrees of freedom, that matches likelihood. For one degree of freedom, it's actually tighter than likelihood. But above two degrees of freedom, it's wider than likelihood, which is why I agree it's possible this will be a problem in high, raw likelihood as your target function might be a problem in high dimensions. So yeah, you might just want to do that chi-squared fix. So you take, if you can find your maximum likelihood point or a good um, approximation of it, you know, just normalize your raw likelihoods by that to give you relative likelihood of something close to it. And then one minus, you know, the CDF for a chi-square distribution with dimension theta degrees of freedom. Sure. And, uh, but again, check that, see if it works. I think that will work um, or should work and unle unless you got a really, really weird problem. Um, and that actually just starts you out having a direct um, approximation to your confidence curve. But unless it is approximately normal, you would then want to do this next step of computing your p-values by you know, generating faux samples of x. Right. Right. OK, so good luck. And if you do that, let me know how it turns out. Oh, <laughs> hopefully it turns out well. Yeah. Um, you know, just check everything. This is all experimental. We don't have any convergence theorems or anything telling us exactly what we should do yet. This is kind of using your knowledge of what your target function is, et cetera, and um, doing the best you can. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much for the insightful discussion. Thank you. Yep, thank you. That's a great but, question. Yeah, I think I'll move on to our next question. Um, Alex, uh, do you have one? Yeah, um, I think it's interesting the, uh, the discussion with Adolphus there about this sampling method. Um, just, I, I, I'm currently working uh, on a case where I've got a high dimensionality problem that I'm trying to generate confidence structures for. And it, it's at the moment like just a very basic one using p values. Um, to go about it and I'm generating that just by like sampling uniformly across the support ah. of the problem and uh, like I'm I'm on an R in now over like whether or not that will give because I, I can I can calculate the likelihood of the samples but if you so, can um, I mean do, should I jump in yeah <laughs> or... yeah feel free Okay, um, so that's a thing you can do if you have a finite support uh, for your, um, which you do in say binomial inference, but you don't in something like normal inference. Or, or, or if you can estimate a finite support that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, if, yes, that's true. Um, so sampling uniformly across finite support, the, the only necessary problem with that I see is just if you're going to get enough detail on your confidence curve. And you can kind of look at it and decide for yourself if you like the amount of detail you're getting. Yeah, and like the, the curves you were showing later on like are good for sort of just having a look at the nuts and bolts of how that structure is working. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, you literally just want to uh, I guess in this case, you don't have an analytic solution to compare it against, right? Mm. But you still do want to have, ba, 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 ba. you still do want to have, and this illustration is a little um, misleading, because if you actually look at this plot in R, this little shelf right here does not have that gap. But you basically, you want to see that, say you're using something like 10 to the fourth samples, you do want to see that you're you've got almost like a solid line where yeah. you know where things are happening in your plausibility distribution you know it, it's just a question of um i guess you could say efficiency you know mm. uniform sampling over the support might end up being really inefficient um 
for something like binomial with n equals 10 k equals 4, uniform would be just fine, uniform of the support. But when you get to something, you know, like we are doing at the end with the PPV stuff, um, you know, these structures, if you did it uniformly, that <laughs> all this is basically wasted. Yeah, yeah, you know it's I mean? basically useless. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you really just want to be focusing in on this section. But yeah, it's just, just a question of having the right amount of detail. And, yeah, yeah. I know, like, the, the approach of them, it tries to restrict a, like, a, a set from the support that gives like, good coverage uh, of the space where there is actually a, a reasonable amount of likelihood. Mm. But like, it, it, like, it's essentially just trying to chisel away the useless bits. Uh, yeah. But I get, like, that kind of leads me on to the, the second point. Um, the, the whole the concept of consonants in these confident structures Mm. Uh, like that that was a, a big driver towards the the wally based method of binomial estimation mm -hmm. um and I, again like because i'm using a p a p value approach to try, to try and construct this based on uh like uh was it the stern structure that was just the, the raw likelihood that wasn't mm. con I, it, it wasn't using raw so. likelihood as a test statistic yeah basically and did you say you're working with binomial rates? No, it's okay. <laughs> it, it's uh, basically it, it's a structure that's like a, a hyperdimensional Gaussian that's trying to oh. be a fancy way of modeling uh, dependence. But it, it's okay. just like I, like my concern is knowing that the the binomial methods um, using raw likelihood don't lead to consonant structures. Oh, they do. Okay, so so the weird thing, can I jump okay. in? I was, oh, going yeah. to, I was going to say, do, like, do we know what it is that's going on that's causing the little spikes? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, okay. So a very important point, and uh, just for those of you who aren't aware of the context, um, in binomial inference, if you try to use raw likelihood as a test statistic, uh, to get your confidence curve, you'll get these little spikes on your point-wise plausibility distribution. But an important point to note is that doesn't make the structure not consonant. It's still consonant. It's just that your uh, alpha slices, your confidence regions, won't be simple intervals. Um, and my rationalization for why that's wrong is that you're basically, you're contradicting the likelihood function there. You're, you're going up where you should go down. You know what I mean? Like, if you were to plot likelihood against these guys, uh, likelihood and plausibility are both always moving the same direction. But um, if you've got the little spikes, that's not true. But the spikes don't make it not consonant. Like, this whole framework still works even if you've got those spikes. It's just, it's, it's going to be weird. Your answer is going to be weird and counterintuitive in, in that niggling kind of way. But um, that shouldn't be a problem for um, Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, so if you're trying to avoid those spikes because you don't like them for the same reason I don't like them or whatever reason, um, like I said, I haven't seen them happen for uh, Gaussian. It really does seem to be something kind of specific to problems with a finite observable. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would imagine for, for Gaussian, it wouldn't happen, as you say. It was just I would sort of intrigued as to using raw likelihood. Is there something specific about that approach that... Because it, it's, it's as, I mean, you're saying the paper, it's, it's really, really counterintuitive, the plausibility dropping as you move towards the regions of higher plausibility. It doesn't, yeah. like you get the spike and then the plausibility goes down. It yeah. doesn't make any sense. No, you're right. It, it it's just like, is, is that, I, I think it's trying to get ahead around why exactly is that happening using uh, these So methods. in the paper, so, so the big answer to your question is I don't have a cosmic general explanation. Um, you know, I have a local explanation for why it happens to binomial inference, and that can readily be uh, expanded to Poisson inference if you're ever working on that problem. 
And there's a parallel solution for Poisson inference to what we have in the, or what I have in the binomial paper. But um, it just hasn't been written up yet. Uh, but um, I don't have a cosmic explanation for why that happened and how to avoid it in the future. I think if we did, it would be a big step towards having one normative structure for every inference problem. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's part of this being a fundamentally unfinished theory is um, there are definitely, there are definitely additional restrictions that should be placed on these structures that we don't know how to formulate yet. And I'm inclined to be really cautious about how we formulate them because um, you know, over the years I've had to study the history of statistics and if there's like one big meta mistakes, I think, or sorry, one big meta mistake that the, uh, the kind of the classic, like the Naaman's and the Finetti's of the world make, it's trying to tie things off too early. Like, like this is an unfinished framework and I want to be real cautious about how we tie it off. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, that's not a very satisfying answer to your question. The, the answer is I don't know how to avoid it in general. Well, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it means that there's something cool to try and like, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and I thought about originally when the title of this po uh, presentation was like, constant, constant confidence structures and some weird stuff, uh, I was gonna get into some of those issues but I figured it would be better to start off with a presentation about like, here are the numerics we're gonna to use to make this framework uh, operational. But um, there's, there's so many weird things that can happen um, as you pursue this. Um, and spikes aren't even the weirdest thing. Mm. <laughs> um, now, don't get me wrong, none of that weird stuff is as bad as, uh, this hold up none of that weird stuff i'm talking about is as bad as this i'll take spikes over false confidence any yeah. day of the week you know? <laughs> um and if anyone's watching this either now or after the fact online you go learn about the false confidence theorem it, it really you know it, there this new framework has weird ins and outs but none of it holds a candle to what the traditional frameworks are getting wrong and in fact, uh, some of the weird stuff that I want to talk about in the future, pro um, in a future presentation, if I can convince Scott to let me on again, uh, some of those weird ish issues have, um, what's the word, analogs. They have analogs in traditional frequentist inference. Like some of the issues I want to talk about, even the spikes uh, in binomial inference. Um, those happen, you know, those spikes have been recognized for like 60 years, you know, just trying to make simple confidence regions for binomial inference. Um, people have known about those spikes. Um, mm -hmm. They just don't think about it. It just, they just don't think about it the same way. It, being able to look at the whole confidence curve all at once changes the way you look at things and allows you to prototype things faster. But um, yeah, anyway. Um, my point here is there's lots of weird stuff, but don't let that weird stuff dissuade you because the, uh, traditional methods are worse. <laughs> yeah. They're just not recognized for being worse. Yeah. Anyway, um, next, uh, did yeah, you have any follow-up? Uh, no, no, no. Like, I'm, I'm good. Thanks very much for the, uh, for the answers. Sure. All right. Yep. So moving on to the next question, we have one by uh, RG Marty three. Oh, that's Ryan. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> okay. Hey. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Yes. Uh, sorry, I you know, it doesn't have my name. I don't know how to change that. But uh, <laughs> anyways, so yeah. So it's a. Uh, uh, it was an interesting uh, presentation. So I've, uh, I guess, in the past, I've done this thing with um, uh, like the Monte Carlo sampling of the data uh, at different parameter mm. value. 
can even do these I mean, uh, kind of things where you reweight the samples so you can kind of reuse the Monte Carlo samples for different parameter values. That makes uh, sense. One thing that I guess I've not done before um, is this, you've already talked about this a, a, a bit in the in the questions is like the sampling of the thetas. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I guess to, to me, it's. I mean, I, I can see there's some advantage to this because you kind of don't really need to know where to look. You just kind of let the sampling procedure point you in the right direction. So you generate from this posterior distribution and that sort of sends you off to the relevant spots in the parameter space. Mm. But it, I guess it seems that there's, uh, you know, so you, you got this picture of the haze, you know, so it ends up this, this kind of haze is in, in a way is kind of a, um, I mean, in, in a sense, there's some waste here because like there's mm. all lots, I mean, all those points represent places where you've sampled and what you really only care about is the edge. Yeah. So like the, the advantage to this is that you didn't have to really know how to find the edge. You just let the sampling kind of do it for you and then you can ultimately trace out the edge. Uh, but there's yeah. a lot of wasted uh, efforts to get all these points that are kind of in the middle that aren't important. Um, yes. So, and, and I guess on the flip side is that, you know, if, if you wanted to do something like, say, to find like the plausibility interval, say, for some function of the, the, the full parameter, you don't really want like that middle part of the distribution for that. It's like you kind of only want something kind of out in tails because mm. they're like the, you know, like, you know, in some sense, what you want is like the, you know, like the, um, you know, fifth and 95th percentiles of the posterior distribution. So these are somehow out in the tails and not really in the middle. And so out into the tails, it's harder to actually to reach this um, with the, the, the sampling procedure. So yeah. it, it, sometimes you can, you get a lot of samples in the middle, not very many in the tails. And the ones in the middle aren't really all that helpful for kinds of things that you might want to do like the, the the plausibility regions because it's the tails that that matter for that so well, I mean, and you can the, compensate the issue for some of that. Is the, like the, the dimensionality thing is that you know if, if if you're doing it in two dimensions you can get pretty much over the entire space and then mm -hmm. your uh, your 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 haze if you trace this out is going to actually capture the whole um the whole range and you're going to get towards that uh, sort of the maximum that you're trying to um to approximate I just mm -hmm. I worry about getting into ten dimensions, marginal marginalizing down to one. Whether you yeah. can really do a good job of approximating that maximum, the supremum that you're trying to 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 get. I don't. So I don't know. I, I guess I'm wondering if you've if you had any experience with this, like in say ten dimensions. Um, how so the answer is no. I haven't had experience in ten dimensions. Um, but I, I would like to. Uh, a, address a couple points, which is um, you can address some of this, at least in low dimensional, by changing your sampling function, meaning you don't, I'm picking, you know, an analog, uh, fiducial or posterior analog to the confidence curve, but you can, of course, choose to sample something wider than that. Sure. And yeah. if you have a particular value that for whatever reason you're interested in, say because it represents the boundary of your failure domain in an engineering problem or something, you can just sample that. Nothing's stopping you from like including that in your samples. And um, so if there's like some boundary you're particularly interested in, um, you can make sure that's included in your sample. But of course you also wanna make sure you're not just getting like some line of interest, you wanna get stuff around it so that you do you know, recreate this haze effect to get that top line. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, this may not be the best thing in every problem, but I'm not so like, so I'm not saying it won't take some work to figure out how to do this in higher dimensions, but I, I really think it's going to be doable. We just need to make sure we're aiming at the right target function. Uh, like I was talking about with, I think it was Adolphus. Um, you just need to make sure you're like likelihood might say you're in a high dimensional space and you're uh, getting your samples via Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, it may be some work to figure out what sampling function you should use, or sorry, what target function you should be aiming at with your uh, Markov chain. 
but that doesn't mean it won't be unworkable. It just means we need to figure out, you know, well, how do I, you know, how do I tune my target function so that I do fill up the space and fill up those tails? Um, because it, we're able to do, you know, sampling in high dimensional spaces via Monte Carlo for, you know, random uh, distributions. And I, I think in principle, it should be possible to do the same for, uh, for possible for possibility distributions. Um, of course, not perfectly. The difference and, is that so in a in the Bayesian context, like if you're trying to sample these like posterior distributions, the things you generally care about are averages. So yeah, expectations, and so those are things that basically by sampling you can do a good job of approximating them. But yeah. like here, what you want is to optimize, and so basically to optimize, you only really need to evaluate at one point. You just don't know where that point is. Sure. And, and, well, so the, and that's, the, that's the part that's challenging is how to guarantee that you can reach that um, to reach that point. Mm, yeah. Well, it is challenging. And uh, the one thing I'll say in favor of the sampling approach is um, like, you're right, like all these middle points are in some sense wasted. But the thing about sampling is that it's a lot easier numerically than optimization. I mean, a bunch of wasted sampling points may still be less effort than a, if, especially if you're dealing with a black box, black box function, a bunch of wasted sampling points may still be less effort than uh, direct optimi optimization, a any kind of search algorithm. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I actually, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think that this is, uh, the sampling type of procedure seems to make a lot of sense because of you know, because of what you just said. Um, so I was wondering though. So there are these. Uh, there's probably newer things that I'm not aware of, but uh, stuff like um, it's called simulated annealing. So these are other kinds of techniques that are basically sampling based, but they're designed for optimization. So mm. it's basically uh, you're kind of trying to climb up a hill and you take some random steps and then decide whether you accept or reject those moves. Um, and so this is kind of done in a more of a Monte Carlo type of way rather than uh, kind of greedy jumps like for other kinds of optimization procedures. Um, so mm -hmm. I was, I guess I was wondering if that was something that you had thought of is that, I mean, so essentially you're just trying to optimize the, um, this uh, pointwise plausibility curve on the full space, but on some, you know, along some line or on some curve. Yeah. And so if you could sort of formulate this more as an optimization problem, but use these kinds of uh, uh, um, sampling based optimization procedures uh, to handle that. So that was something I had in mind for a while and I, I, I don't really know enough about it to, I, mean, I, I just haven't really got, got to it, but uh, um, just, to, just, an, just an idea kind of mixing this, you know, this notion of optimization and sampling. So, so to answer your question, I, I'm resisting the urge to write down simulated annealing right now because no, I haven't looked at it. I know I've read the term. Uh, do they get into it in um, what is it, Christian Roberts' book with Georgia Casella on uh, Monte Carlo sampling? Uh, I'm, I'm sure that they, they do have it there. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, so I've got a copy of that around here somewhere. Uh, so let me go ahead and write that down. <laughs> okay, so they, to answer your question, no, I have not used simulated annealing, but I am definitely open to the suggestion. Uh, because you're right, if we can sample the um, curve that corresponds to our, um, or the contours that correspond to our um, target variable, our target output, yeah, that, that would be a lot better. Yeah. So did you have any more comments or? No, I think that's, uh, that's it. I mean, there was a lot of talk about the dimensionality curse and those kind of things. So I don't have yeah. anything to say about that, but uh, um, no, I think yeah. this is, this is pretty cool. I, I, I mean, definitely this uh, computation of these things. And I mean, something that I've been kind of thinking about is getting into the higher dimensional problems. And I guess it, I mean, at the moment, the high dimension that I like to think of is 10. Um, it's sort of beyond like what we could, I mean, it's not really high dimensional, but uh, uh, um, is one that's kind of beyond where we can just do some kind of uh, um, 
you know, specific tasks for this, for a particular problem and say, okay, let's do this, 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 and we can solve this problem. But kind of thinking like more broadly is if you get to 10 dimensions, you kind of need something uh, systematic that can um, kind of work more generally. So, um, we, so we do I, the same I, I like the sampling based ideas. I think this is, uh, this is definitely as promising. Yeah, I was going to say we do the same thing in uh, aerodynamics with hypersonics. Uh, you know, Mach 6 isn't really what we think of when we think hypersonic. When we think hypersonic, we're thinking like Mach 15, Mach 20, you know, re-entry or takeoff flows. But um, we do Mach 6 because it's like, it's within, it's easier to experiment with and it has all the characteristics we're looking for. It, that's why I'm yeah. thinking with N equals 10, same deal. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, like it's, um, it's that new, it's, the kind of bottom of that regime we're trying to hit. But um, anyway, so, um, yeah, very nice. yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say about this chart. Um, so, you know, with Feeler Creasy, uh, these curves go out to infinity. They never, they never come back down. And that's actually a low dimensional example of kind of what you're talking about, because of course, there's no way to sample infinity well um so i would take that as kind of you know even the perfect curve never you know comes back down this asymptotically approaches whatever value and this uh asymptotically approaches the same value from above and um so any kind of convergence theorem for uh this approach would I think have to be provisional on you know the set that interests you and how well you're sampling it. You know what I mean? Uh, there, there's well, provisionality to this. <laughs> um, when it, no, I mean, I mean, I guess certainly if you were trying to find like a plausibility interval, you'd be it's an attempt to solve an equation that doesn't have a solution, and so then you you there's definitely would be some kind of limitations to this. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, in, in terms of, I mean, I think what would happen is that if you were, you know, doing these things like with posterior samples, of course, you can never reach, like, it's not going to go out to infinity, but there's going to be a huge variance in these samples. And so you'll, you'll yeah. end up stretching, you know, maybe minus a hundred to a hundred, things like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, well, with the uh, ratio of means, I was actually really <laughs> shocked at how far out the min and max uh, sample points were. The ratio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh. I mean, it's like a, a, this is kind of like a you end up with something that's not unlike a Cauchy distribution. So the tails yeah. are super, super heavy. Um, samples would be way, way out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quick note: uh, this mu two, this should be mu one divided by mu two. I that's a typo. My bad. Yeah, just for posterity. <laughs> um, so, do we have more questions? Yes, um, I think Alex, you've got another question, don't you? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, um, it's just a, a quick one. Um, uh, just in, in terms of sampling, again, there, am I understanding it right? It's like the, the Fisher combination is used to take like the plausibilities of each of the variables that you're propagating through the function. Mm -hmm. and to determine a, a plausibility of whatever point is returned. Uh, yes, or yeah. more primitively, it's used to get the plausibility, a joint plausibility for that as, like, say you start with two variables and you've got a sample for each, you're combining their plausibilities to, you know, give a plausibility for that state, for that point in two space. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if, if you had a monotonic function that, or like, I suppose, yeah, it wouldn't work for Blackboard, but if you knew your function was monotonic, could you not, um, and you wanted like a 95% confidence interval for your output uh, function, yeah. could you determine the, the plausibility intervals that would correspond to that from each of the input variables and propagate those two intervals through just sampling directly from the confidence structures and then that would give you an output a complete output interval that would be at the appropriate confidence level 
Sure, that, that's basically the theoretical idea underpinning level-wise propagation, isn't it? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. That, <laughs> that, it's, I don't know, it seems like a cool... Yeah, yeah, and so, so, so the answer to your question is yes, yes. Like, like whatever, however, <laughs> however I interpret that question, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> you can do that. Um, and it does require knowledge of the function. And if you're saying, say, I want a 95% on my output, it's a monotonic function. So I'm going to do, I think it's like 98% on the inputs. That's just mm. level wise propagation. That's going to correspond to these squares. And I would, you know, caution you as we see in mu2 uh, minus mu1, you know, this dashed line, that outer line, that is what you get doing level wise propagation. So you're going to get something that's wider. Typically, you'll get something that's wider than necessary. Uh, here's the same deal for uh, PPV. Is this red line is what you would get via level-wise propagation. And for this plot, I did exactly what you're talking about. I, I said, OK, I want 95% um, on you know, my PPV. So, and for the Titan structure, I just said 90 5% on PPV will correspond to 95% on my inputs, even though that's not necessarily safe. Even if you do that, okay. you still get something wider than the sampling base structure. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's some loss of efficiency there, but it's, you know, it's a thing you can do. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be a conservative way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, strictly speaking, this would be the conservative way over here of where you're uh, adjusting your, um, you know, one alpha prime, your adjusted confidence on the output is equal to one minus parentheses, one minus alpha, you know, to the whatever dimensionality of theta power. Mm. Um, I've got that function somewhere around here <laughs> in the, these slides. I'll uh, I'll send these slides along via email later on so y'all can yeah. have them. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can do that. It just it's gonna be wider than necessary bounds. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, that might be it for questions. Uh, Nick, you had another question. Is there? Or there? Um, I might just ask it by an email. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Is it complicated? Um, I might. Oh wait, you, you muted. Say, say again. I didn't catch that. Um, I said I'll, I'll send it by email. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, I'll look forward to it then. Okay. All right. Okay. So if there's no more questions, um, I'll end recording and I'll end the uh, final. Um, not a formal talk. So yeah, thank you, Michael, for giving an interesting talk. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah.